السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي الرحمة والهدى محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything he has given us we thank him and at the same time we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us increase in goodness and to protect us from evil we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them and to bless every single one of us to accept from us the fasts that we've been engaging in, as well as the salah, the taraweeh, all the extra acts of worship in the beautiful month of Ramadan, and to help us to follow this through even after the month of Ramadan. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, the final in the series, getting to know the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah be pleased with them. This evening we are speaking about two of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first one, Shaddad ibn Aws ibn Thabit al-Khazraji al-Ansari. He was a great companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a young boy at the time when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived in Medina Munawwara. So Shaddad ibn Aws is the son of Aws ibn Thabit, who is the brother of Hassan ibn Thabit, radiyallahu anhum. Hassan ibn Thabit was one of the poets of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we will hear who were the other poets as well a little bit later, inshaAllah. So Aws ibn Thabit, who is the father of the hero that we are speaking about today, Shaddad ibn Aws, he had accepted Islam at the hands of Mus'ab ibn Umair radiyallahu anhu. This man was such a great companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Mus'ab ibn Umair. He shifted to Medina Munawwara by the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to teach the message of Islam in a way that so many people accepted Islam at his hands. And today he is known whenever we speak of those who were the first to accept Islam in Medina Munawwara, the name that comes up, Mus'ab ibn Umair radiyallahu anhu. And this is why it is one of the great practices of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we were to also go out to little cities and countries and so on, and to live in their midst in order to teach them the deen in a way that subhanallah, it will be written next to our name the day we die, that this person has made an effort in a far off society, far off community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to learn from the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the way he sent out his messengers to teach, or should I say, his companions to teach the people in different cities and towns all over the peninsula. So, Aws ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu accepted Islam very early and something happened upon the hijrah. He accepted Islam at the hands of Mus'ab ibn Umair and he was from amongst those who pledged the second allegiance of Aqaba during the period of Hajj just prior to the Hijrah with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mina. It was known as Al-Aqaba to Thaniya, the pledge of Aqaba, the second one. So later on when the Hijrah occurred, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he had done is he fostered a relationship of brotherhood between the people who had come from Mecca known as the Muhajireen and the people who were from Medina Munawwara known as the Ansar. So who was brought forth as a brother of Shaddad ibn Aws's father? So Aws ibn Thabit was paired with Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. And why was that so unique? It was unique because Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was married to the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ruqayya binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah be pleased with her. So this was a very great virtue of Thabit ibn Aws, or should I say Aws ibn Thabit. It was a great virtue because he happened to be so close to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So his son Shaddad learned from Uthman ibn Affan a lot. And he became similar to Uthman ibn Affan in his worship. We all know about Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. He was a very pious man. He used to read the Quran a lot. He was in salah a lot. He used to constantly be in the worry that he has perhaps displeased Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he would protect himself from anything that would displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Shaddad ibn Aws as a young boy learned from 
Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an. And at the same time, he was very close to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because it was the same family that was looking after the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ruqayya binti Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But sadly, she passed away when everyone had gone out for the battle of Badr. And it is reported that Aws ibn Thabit was martyred in the battle of Uhud. So his son was known as a person who took after his father. And Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhu, a great, a great man, he learned a lot. He used to teach as much as he could. And he was a very pious person. He read a lot of salah. And one or two of the good qualities that we can make mention of here, although they were all good qualities, but the outstanding qualities of his, one of them that I've made mention of, or that is made mention of, when he used to try to sleep at night, he could not fall off to sleep immediately. He used to find it very difficult to fall off to sleep. And the reason is, he used to worry about the fire of Jahannam. And he used to say, how can my eyes close when I'm concerned that if I were to die, where will I go? Will I go to Jannah? Will I go to Jahannam? When I know about the fire and I know about how hot it is and how the punishment is and I've heard all about it, I cannot sleep. My eyes don't close. I cannot rest. And so a little while later, he would get up and read Salah. And sometimes he would continue reading Salah until the time of Fajr set in. And then Fajr would be read and the day would begin. Subhanallah. So he was a man who found it difficult to sleep in the evening. And you know, when we find it difficult to sleep, what do we do? I don't even want to go towards answering the question. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Find it difficult to sleep. Some people go and watch a movie. Some people start playing games. Some people have nothing better to do but to entertain themselves with little clips of this and that. And you know, busy on their phones and so on. Here is a companion. When he couldn't sleep, he engaged in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. So this was Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu an. At the same time, he was known for two things. Blessed with both knowledge and wisdom. So his companions, those who knew him later on in his life, they used to say many people have knowledge and some people have wisdom, but very few people have both knowledge and wisdom. And Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhu was one of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us both knowledge as well as wisdom. Now, at the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, if you recall, there was a companion known as Saeed ibn Amir al-Jumahi radiallahu anhu. We spoke about him, if you recall the name. He was granted the task of being the governor of Hims, but he excused himself and he came back. He did not want to be a governor. So in his place, Shaddad ibn Aws was put by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. And it is reported that the people of Hims loved him a lot. And they really obeyed his instruction as the governor of Hims. And he stayed there for quite a long time. But when Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was killed, was martyred, Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu anhu decided to pack up everything and to go back to Medina Munawwara. So he packed up, he saw the fitan, you know, the trials and the difficulties. The term fitna refers to difficult times. And it also refers to trials and calamities and tests. That is the meaning of the term fitna. So when he saw these difficult times, he decided to go back to Medina Munawwara. So he went back to Medina Munawwara. But sadly, the fitna commenced in another way. And when he saw that it's becoming, you know, something that is now getting to eat the core and the roots, and it is starting to create disaster and difference amongst good people, he told his family, you know what? It's not our place to involve and interfere in this type of difficulty trial. We'd rather pack our bags and go somewhere. So he packed some of his belongings. He took his family members and he went to live in Palestine. And he passed away in Palestine, Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu an. One final story we want to hear about Shaddad ibn Aws radiallahu an. He, it is reported that he always loved to hear about Mecca and Medina. And he always wanted to go there. Anyone who was going, he always loved to join them if he could. But sometimes he couldn't. But on one occasion, there was a group of youngsters who were coming from Asham and heading towards Makkah al Mukarramah, going for Hajj. So as they passed Palestine, they met this man, Shaddad ibn Aws. In fact, they passed through a huge tent 
And they saw it and they said, wow, we wonder what's going on here. They had not known Shaddad ibn Aus. They had not seen him before. But they were wondering what was going on. So as, as they got closer, they met a man. And the man was smiling at them happily saying, you know, you're more than welcome and so on and welcome these uh, young men and uh, asked them where they're going. And they said, no, we are going to Mecca and we are intending to go for Hajj. And a little while later, they saw so many young people, young faces, all looking blessed, you know. And it was amazing because they say we saw these faces and we knew that these people are blessed, you know, they, they have some goodness in them. And then we saw a man, an elderly man who looked so blessed and he was so calm and he spoke with so much of wisdom and we heard him say a few words and then he asked us, where are you going? We said, we are going to Makkah for Hajj. He said, hang on, I want to come with you. Some narrations make mention of Umrah and some make mention of Hajj, but what is confirmed is it was a trip to Makkah. He used to yearn, he wanted to go there. So he says, we will join you, I will join you. And when he called his children and a few of the others who were there in order to inform them of his intention to go to Mecca, he began by advising them. Before he told them what his intention was, he began to advise them. And I want to mention some of the advice. He says, any goodness you see in this world is only a tip of all goodness. And any hardship or difficulty you face in this world is only a tip of all hardship. But every goodness will come to you in paradise, in the true sense. What you've tasted of goodness in this world is nothing but a tip in comparison to what you will get in paradise. And the hardship of the world is nothing but a tip compared to the hardship of hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So he says, in this world, the good and the bad of people will be given by Allah whatever he wants to give them. So it is not a sign of the happiness of Allah when he gives you. And it is not a sign of the displeasure of Allah when he takes away from you. Remember this beautiful words. Then he says, however, in the life after death, goodness is only given to those who worked for it. Subhanallah. So be children of the life after and do not become enslaved by this worldly life in a way that you lose your life after. So the moral of what he said is, my children, in this life, you will get a lot, whether you deserve it or not. But when you die, only those who deserve are going to get. So make sure you work towards that, you know, that time when you will be given only upon merit, whether you deserve it or not, you'll be given in this dunya. But in the akhirah, it is only upon those who deserve it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to prepare for the life after death. It is reported that he passed away in Palestine at the age of approximately 75 and approximately 58 years after the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the great man Shaddad ibn Aus radiallahu anhu. Now we will be speaking inshallah of the final, the last of the companions that we will be talking about in this particular series. Perhaps there may be another series at some stage to follow with more of the names because there are so many of the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we have spoken about those whom Allah has made it easy for us to speak about and we have just chosen them based on a list that I was given. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this from us. Who is this companion? He is a man known as one of the poets of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So who were the poets? Okay, let's make mention of their names. Don't forget these three names. Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu was one of the poets of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu. Beautiful name, Rawaha. Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu was one of the poets of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And our hero tonight, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, one of the heroes and one of the poets of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what is meant by a poet of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? They used to use their eloquence and their language and their poetry in order to defend Islam and to embarrass those who tried to harm Islam. So it was so powerful at the time that the Arabs used to say, it is better for us to be harmed by a spear or a sword than to be harmed by the words of these three men, Hassan ibn Thabit, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, and Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhum jami'an. Because the Arabs had memories and they had powerful memories. If someone had uttered the word of poetry, they memorized it 
And it went down in history. They knew it a hundred years down the line. And to this day it is written for us. And we know the poetry of these three men and many more. Even from the, the times prior and previous or prior to Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us eloquence. And grant us a memory as well. To be able to learn, memorize and fulfill in a way that we too can protect Islam. Defend the honor of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen. So this was Ka'b ibn Malik. He was also an Ansari. He came from a very poor background, so much so that it is reported that he was from Ahlu Sufa. Ahlu Sufa are those who were poor and who did not really have much in terms of wealth, but they dedicated their lives to learning Islam. And then when they learned it, they practiced upon it and they taught the others. Today, if you travel to Medina Munawwara, you will notice a raised platform somewhere in the front of the Masjid of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam towards the front. And it is reported that similar to that place or at the place was where the people of Sufa used to actually gather. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and grant us barakah in learning. As I was coming in, one of the young boys was asking me, what are the blessed times to memorize the Quran? And wallahi, there are so many blessed times. One of them is immediately after sunset. One of them is early morning between Fajr and sunrise. One of them is immediately after sunrise. And subhanallah, there are so many blessed times. But the moral or should I say the main point is for us to leave sin. Because if we continue to sin, our memory deteriorates. And this is why one of the uh, teachers of Imam Shafi'i, rahmatullahi alayhi, he told Imam Shafi'i, that if you would like a powerful memory, you need to abstain from sin. Because he who sins will not be able to memorize the goodness of the revelation, which is the nur given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah forgive us and may He make us from those who can abstain from sin. Ameen. So Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu an, he accepted Islam also with Mus'ab ibn Umair subhanallah <laughs> radiallahu an. May Allah bless this man. What a blessed man. Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu an. The wealthy young boy who became known as one of the poorest of the lot just because he accepted Islam, his family disowned him and so on. You know the story of Musab ibn Umair, we spoke about him radiallahu anhu. So Ka'b ibn Malik al-Ansari radiallahu anhu took part in the pledge, the same second pledge we spoke about when we mentioned the father of Shaddad ibn Aws, whose name was Aws ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu jami'an. And thereafter, he did not participate in the battle of Badr. One might ask why? Because participation in the battle of Badr was not compulsory. It was voluntary. The Prophet ﷺ only took with him a few men, 313 according to some narrations. That was not all the companions, but whoever wanted to come came. So the main, or should I say, the senior Sahaba made sure that they did not miss that battle. They made sure because obviously they were close to Muhammad ﷺ. They went with, but the others, a lot of them had stayed behind and it was not bad to have stayed behind from Badr because it was not compulsory to attend. But any battle where the Prophet ﷺ conscripted young men, it was their duty to take part. And if he said everyone has to attend unless you have an excuse, then there was nobody who was exempted from this. So one of those battles was the battle of Tabuk. Whenever you hear the name of Ka'b ibn Malik anhu, two things should come to your mind. One is the fact that he was the poet of Muhammad ﷺ. And two is the battle of Tabuk. Remember this, the battle of Tabuk. Why the battle of Tabuk? Because the Prophet ﷺ prepared an army to fight in Tabuk. When they had, the Romans had actually killed one of the ambassadors of Muhammad ﷺ and so on. And it's a long history. There was a reason why they had to go back to tackle these people who harmed the Muslims. So he said, everyone has to come out. And it was a difficult time period was of extreme heat in the Arabian Peninsula, you know, today we cannot tolerate, you know, the heat without air conditioning. At that time, where was the air conditioning? Subhanallah, severe, intense heat. And at the same time, it was a very, very great distance to be covered, you know, long distance. And this is why Muhammad Sallallahu said, we need to prepare very well. They prepared in advance. They prepared with their wealth. They prepared with their camels. They had thousands of camels and so many of the men, subhanallah. And they began to leave for Tabuk. Each one had to prepare. So Ka'b ibn Malik al-Ansari radiallahu anhu says, I love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa so much, but I had one weakness, procrastination. 
And we need to learn from this. A lot of us procrastinate so much so that we leave our salah. We say, okay, I'll read it just now. Brothers and sisters, the first trap of shaitan, if you want to know that you are entrapped by the devil, is when you say, I'll read my salah just now. Those words just now, they come from shaitan. You must know that. The words just now come from shaitan. Because with us as Muslimin, with the time of salah enters, you get up and your life changes. Until you finish that salah, you don't rest. That's a true believer. Subhanallah. That's about salah. Look at what happened to the battle of Tabuk. This man, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu says, you know, I really wanted to go, but I told myself, okay, I'll prepare my camel. The days were passing and I will prepare, I will prepare. Then I saw everyone was preparing. I used to look at them and tell them, tell myself that, you know what? It's going to be easy for me. I can do it quickly. Everyone is taking time. I can, you know, prepare in a short while. Not realizing before I knew it, the people started leaving Medina. The Prophet ﷺ was going. I hadn't yet done anything. So I said, no problem. I will join them. Don't worry. I've got fast animals. I'll join them on the road. Subhanallah. Look at this procrastination. It happens with us when it comes to Salah, when it comes to Ibadah, when it comes to turning to Allah. Many of us say, I need to turn to Allah. I need to change my ways. I need to leave my sin. And we keep on saying, I need to, I need to, until the need for death comes in front of us. May Allah forgive us. Really. So don't say that. Learn from the story of Ka'b ibn Malik. We don't want to die having procrastinated. Subhanallah. We want to be from those who made the change when we felt we needed to. And may Allah make us feel we need to change. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us feel that we need to change right here and right now. I mean, so my brothers and sisters, Ka'b ibn Malik says, so I said, okay, I will catch them. He is narrating his own story. He says, I will get, I will catch them. No problem. But before I knew it, they were already too far. And then I started saying, no, now I can't go. I can't go. And then a day or two later, I started regretting it in my heart to say, everyone is gone. And what made it worse is every time I came out, the people I saw were either old who had excuses or people who were known hypocrites. So where did I fall in? I was neither a known hypocrite, nor was I old. I was genuine. I had love of Allah and his messenger. But this delay, delay, delay matter made me stay behind and I don't know what to do. So he says, I felt so bad. And I started asking members of my family, what should I do? What type of excuse can I give Muhammad sallallahu I can just present an excuse and tell him something, you know, that I had something that went wrong and so on. So I started thinking of excuses and asking my family members for excuses. And after a little while, he says, Subhanallah, I started hearing that the Muslims are returning. And he says, I started feeling so bad. And I was wondering, what am I going to do? But I, I made a promise to Allah. I said, you know what? I will not tell a lie. I will go to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I will tell him exactly what happened. That look, I have no excuse. I just delayed it. And before I knew it, you were gone. And now you guys, you are coming back and I have lost. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala forgive him, forgive all of us. So when he heard Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had come back, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a habit. Whenever he came back from a journey, before he went home, he went to the masjid. He read two rakat of salah, asked Allah's goodness and so on. And then he went home. What a great sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Coming back from journey, first place he went to was the masjid. Two rakat of salah at least, offer some prayer and then he would go home. So he said, I went to the masjid. I saw Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But before we speak about what happened there, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remembered Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. When they were in Tabuk, he asked his companions, where is Ka'b? Where is Ka'b ibn Malik? So someone said something bad that you know what? He is arrogant or whatever. They said some bad words about him. Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu immediately said, hey, don't speak bad about him. We don't know any evil from that man. He's a good man. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was silent. No comment. Neither for nor against. No comment. Now when he came back sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ka'b ibn Malik says, I was in the masjid. I came to the masjid and I saw him when he finished reading his salah. There were people around him and people were coming with excuses. There were 80 odd people who were coming with excuses that, you know, I stayed behind because I had this problem, that problem. So he would make dua for them, ask Allah to forgive them. And he would tell them that Allah knows the truth, which means what, what is between you and Allah, what you are hiding, that is between you and Allah. So one man came, presented excuses. Another one presented excuses. Many more came and started presenting excuses. And he says, then I came forward. And when I came forward, subhanallah, 
I told Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In fact, he looked at me and he said, "Oh Malik, oh Kaab, where were you?" He says, "Oh Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I have no excuse. This is what happened, and I stayed behind, and I delayed, and before I knew it, you were gone, and I felt so bad, and I thought I would catch you, I couldn't catch up, and at the same time, now I'm sitting and I'm at a loss." So he looked at him and he told the companions around around him, "This man is speaking the truth." So go away from me until Allah tells me what to do in your regard. Now, why was this? Because the others came and presented excuses if they lied or didn't lie between them and Allah. This man came and told the truth. Now, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam knows that no one was excused. So, what to do to him? I need instruction from Allah. So he said, "I will wait until Allah tells me what to do." So he says, "I went away." And as I went away, he says, "I felt so bad, and I felt so hurt." And there was an instruction that came from Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to say that this man, nobody should talk to him until Allah reveals verses or until Allah tells me what to do about him. So he says, just before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that, one man comes to me and told me. That why didn't you give excuses like all the others? And Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam would have been happy. You know, it, it, it was so easy to make him happy. So he said, "I told Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that wallahi, if it was anyone besides you, it was easy for me to just make an excuse and make him happy. I'm an eloquent man. I can make an excuse and make him happy. But I know it is you. If I lie to you, Allah will disgrace me. This is why I'm telling you the truth." So he said, "I thought. Let me present an excuse." And I told myself, "No ways. The truth, and I will just say the truth, no matter what happens as a result." So Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam instructed his companions not to talk to him at all. And Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam stopped looking at him, and he says, "I asked, is there anyone else? Is there anyone else who is in my position? You know, there must be others, maybe, who might have had the same problem." So someone had told him just prior to them cutting off from him that you know what there are two other people Murara ibn Rabia and Hilal ibn Umayya. Three. How do you remember these names? Quite easy. Just remember Makkah, Mim, Kaf, and the Ha. Right. So Murara ibn Rabia, Kaab ibn Malik, and Hilal ibn Umayya. These are the three names. Okay. So Makkah. You just remember that, inshallah. Murara ibn Rabia, Kaab ibn Malik, and Hilal ibn Umayya. So Hilal ibn Umayya and Murara ibn Rabia, they were the other two. He says, "Now I know that Hilal ibn Umayya was a little bit elderly, and they're in the same boat. No one is speaking to them, not at all." So he says, "I used to greet my friends and the companions, no response. Try and talk to them. I used to go out to the market. As for my two colleagues, they stopped coming to the market. They stopped coming in public because no one was speaking to them. They felt it. But I was young and energetic. I used to go out and greet people on their face." They didn't reply. Look the other way and carry on. He says, "I felt so bad. I used to go to the masjid to read salah, and I noticed Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam never looked at me, not even by mistake. He always avoided me completely. I tried to greet, no response, nothing. Why? Because there was an instruction of Allah being awaited, and I felt hurt. I used to cry. Subhanallah. I used to cry. Now one might ask that, look, in Islam, when someone greets you, you're supposed to reply. This." Was the only exception, or at that time the exception? May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala grant us all a lesson from this. So he says, I had a very good, good friend of mine who was a cousin, and we were so close in friendship. He was Abu Qatada. I climbed the wall going into his little garden, and I saw him there, and I greeted him, and he looked away, and I'm shocked. It was the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to all the companions to boycott the three of us, and I was so so hurt in the sense that I was asking Allah, Ya Allah, forgive me what I have done. And Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, I have to wait for instruction from Allah. Those who presented their excuses, that's one thing, but these three had no excuse, nothing, and they stayed away from something when we really needed them. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. So he said, "I waited. I tried so many other things." He says, "The worst thing that could ever have happened happened. A man came from Asham, and he asked the people, 'Where is Kaab ibn Malik?' They just pointed in my direction. He came with a letter, a letter from Asham, 
What did the letter say? The letter said, O oh, Ka'b ibn Malik, we have heard that your people have boycotted you. We offer you refuge. Leave that religion and join ours. Come along. He said, Wallahi, I took that letter and threw it into the fire that was burning straight away. Because I had love for Allah and His Messenger. And I knew that this will not last because as much as it hurt me so much, but it had to end. However, a month passed and still this continued. And 40 days passed and then news comes that Muhammad sallallahu has instructed our wives to go home. Allahu Akbar. Wives must now depart, separate from your wives. That was the instruction. You must separate from your wives. So Malik, this Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, his wife, she, he had to send her home, instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And Hilal ibn Umayyah, his wife came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, you know, Hilal is an elderly man. Can I not just serve him? You know, so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, okay, but you don't share the bed with him. He says, the sharing the bed stopped the day this problem started. This man has been crying and he's been in sorrow ever since. He's such an old man. He doesn't even know what to do. So talking about, you know, marital relations, that was a long time ago. It's already stopped. Subhanallah. So one man comes or one of the family members, the men were not talking to Ka'b ibn Malik, but one of the family members of Ka'b ibn Malik says, you know what? Rather than sending your wife away, speak to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Send your wife again to him and make an excuse similar to that of Hilal ibn Umayyah's wife. Perhaps you'll be allowed. He says, I can't do that. I'm young. I don't have any excuse. It's, I, I need to be penalized. I don't have an excuse. I, what I did was wrong. So those 10 days were the most dreadful days in the life of this man, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu an, and his colleagues. Murara ibn Rabi' radiallahu an, and Hilal ibn Umayyah radiallahu an. So Imagine, he says, the 50th night I spent and in the morning I read Salatul Fajr. When I read Salatul Fajr, I was sitting on the rooftop and I heard someone's voice at the top of Jabal Sila. Jabal Sila is the mount of Sila, which is in Medina Munawwara. To this day, you probably will see that mount. It is still there. And I heard someone scream. Oh, Ka'b ibn Malik, good news for you. And he says, as soon as I heard it once, twice, I fell prostrate to thank Allah. I said, there's some good news here. It can only be one thing. The man is calling me, which means now they're talking to me. Something has come and it's good news. So he says, people started rushing towards me. A man on a horse came and said, your forgiveness has come. Subhanallah. And he says, they began to embrace me. He felt a hand after so long because no one was greeting him. No one was shaking his hand. He felt a hand after so long, the warmth of it, the tears rolling. You know, the man was so emotional and it is reported that he was so emotional that when the person whose voice he had heard had come in front of him, he took off his own clothing to give that man. Because at that time, there was a culture where when you're coming with some serious news and you're telling the truth, you take off your shirt, you know, you take off your top so that people know, hey, this man is not telling a lie. He's telling the truth. It was a culture at the time. Unlike the footballers of today, may Allah protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So here we have Ka'b ibn Malik. He was so happy, so delighted. He says, you know what? I rushed towards Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I entered the masjid. And I saw him sitting and I looked at him and his face lit up as though it was a piece of the moon. Whenever he was happy, his face was shining as though it was a piece of the moon, subhanallah. And he says, I was so happy. I greeted him and he responded back to me. He says, I was so delighted. I couldn't believe what was happening. And I was, I had this embrace from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And he tells me, oh ma, oh Ka'ab, good news. The best day, today is the best day ever for you from the day you were born. The best ever day. So he says, I asked him, is it from you or from Allah? Now that is a powerful question. What does that mean? Which means if you are telling me, it's one of those things. But if Allah has said it, it means there's going to be some verses of the Quran here. Subhanallah. And if there's a verse of the Quran, up to the day of judgment, the people will be reading that verse. We read it too, my brothers and sisters. Subhanallah. So Allah wanted to raise the status of this man 
because of his honesty when he sought forgiveness for procrastination. He was honest and he endured so much. And even people tried to tell him, even when people tried to tell him to do things, to present excuses and whatnot, someone came from afar to tell him, let's go away. He said, no, subhanallah. Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu. He was known as one of the three. And you know who the three are, don't you? Subhanallah. Murara ibn al-Rabi'i, Ka'b ibn Malik and Hilal ibn Umayyah radiallahu anhum. So the news came and then he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, No, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, I was so delighted subhanallah that I told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that I want to give out all my money for charity. Whatever I have, I own. It, will, it must go out for sadaqah. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, Hang on, keep a bit of it. It's better for you. You know, sometimes when we have a problem, we say, if this thing happens, I'll give all my wealth. But you don't realize, hang on, you will need a bit of it. You know, relax. That's why we were taught that, you know what, you want to give charity, give. But remember that the charity or the money that you spend on your own family and those who are under your guardianship is also a charity. So my brothers and sisters, this man says, Subhanallah, I was given glad tidings through verses of the Quran, verse number 117 of Surah to Tawbah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of how he has forgiven those who participated in Tabuk from amongst the Muhajireen and the Ansar. And after that he says, and I have also forgiven those three who did not go, they stayed behind. So Allah says, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا Allahu Akbar. And I have forgiven those three who stayed behind. Amazing. And he, this man, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu says, this was definitely not only the best day in my life from the time my mother had given birth to me, but even post that day, I've never had a happier day, never ever had a happier day than that. Because Allah has declared my forgiveness in the Quran, subhanallah. He was one of those who after that never procrastinated. Whenever something had to be done, he was the first one there. Subhanallah. Brothers and sisters, this was a powerful lesson for us all. And we saw how sometimes just the feeling of saying, I will do just now can actually mess us up so much. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and may he grant us eternal paradise. May he grant us paradise without taking account of our deeds. Ameen. May He grant us paradise without hisab, without adab. That means without accounts and without punishing us. Wallahi, keep making that dua. Keep asking Allah's forgiveness. Do not be from amongst those who think, I haven't sinned, so why should I ask for forgiveness? Because we sin without knowing. And subhanallah, asking Allah's forgiveness is a great teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Although he did not need it, he still engaged in it. What about us who need it so desperately? We should be engaging in it genuinely. And as I said, Brothers and sisters, this might be your last Ramadan. This might be the last Ramadan you've ever seen. There are those who started the month with us and disappeared in the middle of the month. May Allah grant them Jannah. There are those who may never see the next month of Ramadan. We might be from amongst those. Make the most of the last few moments of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and grant us all Jannah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.